we're talking on this program each day about the meaning of life. And particularly these days, we're talking about how we believe our life was meant to work and how you and I were meant to operate. How we were meant, that is, by the supreme being that made us. And, of course, we've been going back to as detailed a source of his explanation as we possibly could find, and we seem to find it most clearly expressed in the words of the man that we know as Jesus of Nazareth, that unique human being that lived in the first century of our era and gave every reason for us to believe that he is more than a human being. He not only said that he would destroy death, but he in fact did destroy it. And you remember Liv for more than a month after he was actually killed in an execution outside Jerusalem. And we've been studying his explanation of what his father said was the reason for our existence and how we could fulfill that uh, reason or that purpose. And uh, what we have shared is that our creator made us he made you so that you could enjoy his friendship that's really why he made you and you're not made primarily to eke out a living here on earth somehow or other you're not made primarily to work on a computer or to brush floors or primarily to be a nurse or a doctor you're made primarily to become the kind of person that will be at home with the person who made you uh, for the rest of your existence in other words, he made you to enjoy his friendship, to enjoy his love. And that's why he made you with the same capabilities as he himself has. And what we've been talking about is the three levels of life that he gave us in our own personalities, because you do exist on three different levels. I mean, you exist on a physical level. Obviously, your body is physical, and he gave you a body. Secondly, you exist on a psychological level, or soul, that is your mind and emotions and will. And then the deepest level of all is the level of your spirit. And that's, of course, the heart of his own life. The heart of his life is his spirit. The spirit of God is the very essence of God. The spirit of a man is the very essence of a man. It's you. It's what you are when you're alone. When you're not being motivated or pressured from outside, what you are is your spirit. And your spirit is the part of you that is able to commune with God. And that's why, of course, so much of our argument about philosophy and theology and psychology is pretty pointless because it all takes place in the intellectual realm, in the mind. And the mind is not the part of us that communicates with God. The mind is the part of us that is conscious of ourselves, is, is able to reflect on ourselves, on what we think and what we feel. But the mind itself is not able to get in touch with God. It's your spirit that does that. If you say, well, how does it do that? Well, your spirit is really you, so it's what you really want. Strong desire for God is a first step in beginning to come into communion with him. Second step is, of course, by really giving some attention to another function of your spirit. And we began to talk about that last time. Uh, that is the, fu the function of your spirit known as your conscience. And your conscience is the part of you that urges you to live up to the best that you know. It's not necessarily the set of standards that you have. Those are often influenced by your education and by your family and by your upbringing. It's not necessarily the ethical ideals that you have. Your conscience is, strictly speaking, stripped down to its bare necessity. Your conscience is the part of you that urges you to live up to the best that you know. And it's actually part of God's own mind that he has put into you. And however dead your spirit might be, and you know, you might say, oh, don't talk to me about spirit. I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't have a spirit. Well, most of us feel that way because our spirits long ago have gone to sleep and we exist only on a psychological level or a physical level. But actually your spirit is still inside you, even though it's half asleep and half dead. As far as your creator is concerned, your spirit is still there. And a part, the part of your spirit that is often most alive is your conscience, that part of you that urges you to live up to the best that you know. And actually, the truth is that you'll get far better, you'll get far further in trying to get close to God 
by actually respecting your conscience and by responding to your conscience than by all the other religious practices you might indulge in. Because your conscience is part of God's life within you. And actually, it's a direct hotline that he has to you. It's uh, his own desires for you. And uh, you may say, oh, you're back to this business of being a goody-goody. No, I'm not talking about morals. I'm not talking about what we discuss as humans, morals, or even ethics, or crime. I'm talking about the urges deep within you that you have at times, feelings of I ought that you have. You feel, now I ought to go and visit my mother. Now, really, that isn't a, a crime or not a crime. It's not necessarily moral or immoral. It's not necessarily ethical or unethical. Uh, often nobody will know whether you've done it or not except your mother. But if you will respond to those secret urges within you, you're actually responding to the movement of God's life inside you. Many of them, of course, are absolutely foolish things that uh, nobody else knows about. Now, I'm not talking about silly, uh, psychological imbalanced things like I mustn't walk on the cracks on the pavement or the sidewalk, but I'm talking about feelings that you have at times that I shouldn't do that or I should do that. Sometimes it's maybe a sense, oh, I shouldn't speak to that person that way. Or I shouldn't talk as loudly as I do. Or I shouldn't boast at that moment. Or I shouldn't be facetious at that moment. It's things inside that you sense are things you should do or shouldn't do. And often they're absolutely apart from what the religious people think is right or wrong. And they're usually quite separate from what your colleagues at business or at work or your fellow students think are right or wrong. It's, they consist of God's secret or personal guidance to you. And if you and I would begin to respond to our conscience, we would often sense our spirits, of which our conscience is part, our spirits would begin to get stronger and we would sense, start to sense, more of the invisible, uncreated life of God that is operating all the time in the universe. So your conscience is often the best sign that God has put inside you. It's the clearest evidence that he has of his existence. And when you respond to your conscience, you're often making some of the best steps towards them that you could. Part of the problem that some of us get into is that we begin to substitute other people's standards of behavior for our own conscience. And of course, it works, as you know, two ways. I mean, sometimes... It works in what we regard as the conventional way, you know, as young people, we came from our homes with all kinds of ideas of what were right and wrong. And then as we come to the big bad city and all that kind of thing, then we substitute other people's easier standards or amorality for the morality that we had. Now, I know that that works uh, and that's wrong, but, but I'm not talking particularly about that. Often it happens the other way. Often we live our lives under the pressure of external standards that other people impose upon us. And we think, oh, these are religious, or these are goody-goody standards, or these are moral standards, or these are philosophical standards, or these are psychological standards. Uh, and we think we should abide by those, and often we run our lives by those. And in fact, we end up losing our own selves. We can't find ourselves any longer because we cease to live by our own conscience. We cease to respond to our own conscience. And so our spirit gets more and more dead, and we actually find we are losing ourselves. 
That's perhaps a little of what you remember Wordsworth meant when he said, uh, Heaven lies about us in our infancy. Shades of the prison house begin to close around the growing boy. At length the man perceives it die away and fade into the light of coming day. And uh, so many of us have lost ourselves because we haven't actually listened to our conscience. Let's talk just a little more about that function of our spirits tomorrow.